they were huge compared to the other forms of institutionalization. There was more than 20,000 people in these institutions. They became overcrowded, they became unsanitary. There was an extremely high risk of dying when one was sent to an asylum. These institutions often become dumping grounds for Irish social problems. Once people went inside, they didn't move out again. So there was a sense that people were locked away forever. This is the story of these treatments, one after the other, that they actually are, have no therapeutic effect, but they're highly dangerous and highly damaging. The civil servant who was in charge of medical services referred to patients being deliberately kept at a low level of animal existence. It's certainly one of the most damning documents ever, I think, on an uh, institution in our society. Of all records, the records of uh, the mental hospitals give the deepest insight into the human condition. You know, no other records, I think, give such an insight. These are the personal possessions of hundreds of patients who died over the past century in St. Brendan's Psychiatric Hospital, Grange Gorman, in Dublin. Their owners had typically spent decades in the institution, forgotten by family and society alike, their few modest belongings left unclaimed. Oh, hi, Brian. Uh, it's a handbag with an intact label on it. Yeah. 1962. 62, oh my God. Much of the material dates from the 1950s and 60s a time when Ireland's huge mental hospital system was at its peak. Right throughout the middle decades of the 20th century, Ireland led the world in locking up more of its people per capita in psychiatric institutions than anywhere else, ahead even of the old Soviet Union. For most of the 200 years of its existence, Ireland's state-run mental hospital system had never stopped expanding. Well, the most striking aspect of the Irish mental health system is its size and its scale. It's truly spectacular by international standards. This begs the question, what happened in Ireland? How was it that so many people in Ireland ended up in our psychiatric institutions? Now, there are two explanations that could be put forward for this. The first is that we have an epidemic of uh, mental illness or insanity, as it was then called in Ireland, that was more enduring and more prolific than anywhere else in the world. I don't believe that that's what happened. I don't believe that we had an epidemic of mental illness in Ireland. St. Lomans in Mullingar was home to Hannah Greeley for almost two decades from the mid-1940s. Her account of these years became a bestseller when published in 1971. Hannah herself became a celebrity, appearing on The Late Late Show and in newspaper articles. I was just 19 years of age when I was admitted as a patient to the big house. I often think, sometimes sadly, of the friends I made there, the outcasts, the unloved, the incurably embittered, and the spirited, still fighting for their liberty. Hannah Greeley's writings were republished last year and launched in Roscommon Public Library. Hannah had spent her later years living in County Roscommon, where she died in 1987. In attendance were some of her old friends, together with Galway academic Eilish Ward, who has explored Hannah's world in detail. We now have the opus of Hannah's, all of Hannah's work um, available. Hannah was typical in that her incarceration was involuntary. Training as a nurse in London, she'd been caught up in the bombing blitz during the Second World War and returned home traumatised. She thought she was going into St. Lomans for a rest. Committed by her mother, she found herself locked in with no way out. She was a very strong-willed, very outspoken young woman and it wasn't unusual for people who were perhaps considered to be a little bit challenging or unusual or, or difficult to be considered to be mentally unstable and to be put inside for a rest. And that rest, as we know, turned into 18 years of virtual imprisonment in St. Lomans. At the time Hannah was locked up, there were 25 mental hospitals throughout the island, virtually all of which had been built in the 19th century. But before the era of the lunatic asylum, those suffering from mental illness often ended up in dire poverty, wandering the land destitute and starving. 
The first real asylum was uh, St. Patrick's Hospital or Swift's Hospital in Dublin, which was founded following the bequest of Jonathan Swift, the writer. And this was a charitable institution and it was quickly overcrowded, oversubscribed. It was apparent that there was a need for a much more systematic approach to the problem. So that was the state system. And that started in the prisons and the workhouses with lunatic wards in prisons and lunatic wards in workhouses and eventually the establishment of asylums. The first large public asylum was uh, the Richmond Asylum in Dublin, in Grange Gorman, now known as St Brendan's Hospital, and that opened in 1815. These institutions grew to have an immense impact on their local areas. St Bridget's in Ballinasloe was a typical example. For well over a hundred years, almost half of the local population was connected economically to the asylum, whether as employees, suppliers or patients. When Balnasloe opens, it has beds for 150 patients. And this was the subject of a great deal of discussion because it was claimed you couldn't find 150 lunatics in the whole of the country, never mind in the province of Connacht. And within two years, there are 300 patients in the institution and it continues to grow steadily over the course of the 19th century until uh, by the end of the century, there are nearly 1,200 patients. By 18... 31 and thereabouts, there were a number of provincial lunatic asylums, such as at Carlow, Limerick, Ballinasloe, and so on. This was really the first wave of asylum provision. And within a few years, it became clear that this provision was inadequate because the number of lunatics and, of course, idiots um, who were the intellectually disabled, referred to idiots and imbeciles in those days, uh, were also provided for in these uh, district lunatic asylums. And report after report of the inspector indicated sanitary conditions, overcrowding, discomfort, and spread of what was called zymotic disease, that's to say gastroenteritis and diseases of that sort because of the overcrowding. In consequence, further asylum building took place. As the asylums grew and spread, so too did a range of new and often bizarre treatments. People lost faith in the old folk remedies and locations reputed to cure illness. The most famous of these was here in Glenagalt in County Kerry. It means the Glen of the Mad in Irish and the earliest references to its strange curative effects date from the 17th century. Bridget O'Connor has lived in the Glen all her life. We always had the tradition of people coming to the well and people would occasionally call to our house and ask where was the well. And a number of years ago, a gentleman came and he had been very interested in the water and the whole story around Tobernangalt. And he asked, suggested to my father that he would take a sample of the water and get it analysed chemically. And based on that uh, analysis, they found that there was a high content of lithium in the water. And as we all know, lithium is used in the treatment of manic depression. So there may be a very logical explanation for the cure. The waters of Glenagalt were probably more benign than many of the early treatments experienced by inmates of the institutions. Psychiatrist Brendan Kelly has made detailed historical studies of a number of aspects of the mental hospital system. Many different agents were used. Digitalis was used, that's from the foxglove, and it remains in some medications now, but not, not used for mental illness. There was a belief that purging was important, making people vomit repeatedly was also important. And that was borne out not just in, in mental health care, but also in uh, physical health care right through this era. And that belief was very slow to die away. Um, so almost any agent you can think of was administered to individuals with mental illness uh, in an effort to help. A man in Cork called Halloran, psychiatrist in Cork called Halloran, who established his own hospital there, devised a device called the Halloran Swing, whereby the lunatic was placed in a, a cage, as it were, which, by means of pulleys and so on, could be rotated at great velocity, so that uh, the lunatic, if not cured, certainly became dizzy. And he contrived it in such a fashion as it could turn sideways and they could be turned this way. Uh, as well, uh, along the other axis. Now, by contemporary standards, this would uh, be inconsistent with human rights standards and the rights of the mentally ill. But Halloran believed this could be a therapeutic tool, and he wasn't alone. These chairs spread right across Europe, 
uh, Germany, France, um, for many decades and were in use right up to the end of the 1800s. This 19th century document listing probable causes of insanity gives a sense of how all-embracing these were. Perhaps the most intriguing are the three cases whose cause is listed as husbands in California. In 1810, William Saunders Halloran in Cork wrote one of the earliest textbooks on mental illness, making him a pioneer in the field. He was the first person in Ireland systematically to record what he believed were the causes of mental illness. Social unrest, alcohol abuse, syphilis. And these are all reasonable, rational thoughts. Well, one thing that's very clear is that diagnostic categories change and are shaped by the social context of the particular time. Take, for instance, causes of insanity. You would have religious excitement, pride, anger, domestic uh, disagreements. Love, jealousy and seduction was a diagnostic criteria. At that stage, County Cork had the highest rate of love, jealousy and seduction with eight male cases and 18 female cases in 1889. So almost any form of human behaviour that was any way an affront to society could be diagnosed. Uh, they were very loose, very all-encapsulating. Looking into the category of lunatic, again, the, the phraseology within that was very diverse and it changed a lot. The word dementia was used commonly, and this was a reference to dementia precox, which is a term used for what we now call schizophrenia. So the term dementia did not mean dementia as we now know it. There was also a mania was a phrase that was used and that would correlate with the current use of the word psychosis and possibly psychotic elation. In other words, uh, manic depression in the manic phase. And they also used the word uh, melancholia. And melancholia uh, probably referred to depression. The looseness of diagnosis can be seen from the case of John M locked up in Ballinasloe for a number of years in the late 19th century. There was one case of a man who had a three-quarter hunter that he brought to sell at the October Fair. He sold the horse, he claims, he sold the horse to a major Woodward, uh, who was a significant landowner just outside of Ballinasloe. And he claims that he was cheated on the deal, that Woodward didn't pay the price that he had agreed. So he protested, he went to Woodward's house. He was arrested and he was charged uh, under the Dangerous Lunatics Act as a dangerous lunatic. He's brought to the Balnuslow Asylum. The physician says that he has a fixed obsession with uh, the, uh, the belief that he was cheated by Major Woodward, but he shows no other signs of erratic behaviour or insanity, but he, he sticks to this conviction that he has been cheated. And in that case, it's extremely difficult to say whether or not this, this patient was wrongfully committed. The Board of Governors of the Balnuslow Asylum were all drawn from the local ascendancy. So that when this patient petitions the board for his release, the fact that he holds this conviction that he was cheated by one of their peers seems to tell very much against him. Uh, he was eventually discharged, but he's only discharged when he reaches the stage where he says it was all a mistake. One of the early theories underlying the institutions was known as moral management. It had its origins in post-revolutionary France, where Philippe Pinel, a key reformer, famously struck the chains from the limbs of lunatics in the Paris asylums. In Britain, the same enlightened principles were being applied by a Quaker family, the Tukes, who founded the hugely influential York Retreat for the Insane. Moral management was also keenly adopted by those running the Irish institutions, who were generally laymen rather than doctors. Psychiatrists as such did not yet exist. Ireland was really quite at the cutting edge of moral management. And the first thing to, to remember is that moral did not mean then what it means now. Moral meant it had to do with the whole person. And the principle of moral management was that an individual with mental illness would improve if they had a uh, interpersonal relationship with their doctor. That is, the doctor uh, spoke with them, listened to them, and they had conversations. And reason and emotion were used in order to address the person's psychological problems. What it meant was a regime that treated patients humanely, so that you moved away from a coercive 
form of control within institutions. And you tried as far as possible to replicate the patient's ordinary life outside the institution. And it was hoped by treating them calmly and kindly, by not threatening them or using any kind of force, they would slowly recover their reason. That actually brought in a fairly strong movement of seeing people as human beings, that if they were treated kindly and opened to education. For example, in Grange Gorman, they had virtually all the patients in, in primary education at one stage. Unfortunately, once the medical ethos took over, that all deteriorated. And what emerged was a tension between the moral manager, who was not a medical doctor, and then the doctor, we would now call him the psychiatrist, as psychiatry was emerging as a profession. And I think as the 1800s progressed, the more, if you like, biological medical model became more uh, uh, strident, or the medical model went into the ascendancy and the moral management uh, faded somewhat. Constant overcrowding in the institutions meant that moral management had little chance of working. By the mid-20th century, its benign regimen was a distant memory. Hannah Greeley's experience in St. Lomans Mullingar was of drudgery, year after year, with little or no positive therapy. I had sewn thousands of garments and ironed thousands of shirts, among other things, Yet I seemed no nearer liberty than when I did my first day's work gratis. I felt that my life was worse than slavery, for slaves are freed, and some buy their own freedom by earnings, by work. I began to loathe every day of my internment. One of the things about the book that's really striking is she had virtually no relationship with, or there's very little reference to psychiatric, uh, both therapeutic interventions and also personnel. Uh, the, the relationships that she describes with a lot of severity, some small cruelties, um, humiliations that seem to have been part of the daily life of the psychiatric institutions, at least in her account. So why were so many people locked away within the asylum system? And who were they? The explanation that we had a greater incidence of mental illness than other countries was discussed from the 1800s right through the 1900s, and you still come across it today from time to time. I mean, it is a reasonable thought, given the huge increase in numbers. But the huge increase in numbers has more to do with society and a societal desire to address the problems presented by certain people who don't quite fit in for whatever reason. So that was going on, certainly. If you, if you look at the single driver behind the expansion of the system, it's the use that communities and families in particular make of the asylums. They recognise them as a resource. They turn to them in the hope of a cure for patients. They use them as respite care and uh, you'll see patterns of admission and discharge that show the families take a very active part in putting their relatives in and taking them back out. It has been maintained that we as a people are madder than other people. But when you begin to look at the 19th century, you can see particular things that happen in Ireland that are exclusive to Ireland in terms of their scale. We haven't perhaps even begun to look at the psychological consequences of the Great Irish Famine, which began in 1845. You could see in the short term and the long term how that would have contributed to more people being committed to institutions. They're not just uh, about mental health reasons, they're about social reasons, they're about economic reasons. The post-famine decades witnessed a profound shift in Irish society, which lasted well into the middle of the 20th century. Families stopped subdividing the land, as it was perceived that the resultant tiny holdings had worsened the effects of the famine. Now just one child, usually the eldest son, inherited everything. With no land for the other children and very few jobs available, their chances of marrying and raising their own families diminished. Many remained single, isolated and with little useful occupation. You could argue that the integrity of the family in the post-famine period is in some senses sacrificed on the altar of economics and the new economic realities. Now, how does that impact socially and how, how does it impact psychologically? Well, it's quite clear that there's a stricter moral code, uh, a stricter attitude to what's acceptable, what's unacceptable, the definition of what constitutes deviance, the definition of what constitutes dissidence, the idea that there is a, a, a more conservative code, and that those who don't live up to this or those who find themselves at odds with this 
uh, do not have a place in society. And the answer a lot of the time is to try and get those people behind high walls. Land issues became a key factor in the committals of many people and remained so well into the 20th century. All of this was greatly facilitated by legislation unique to Ireland, the Dangerous Lunatics Acts, a legal framework in place for well over a hundred years. I think the linkage between dangerousness, criminality and mental illness was very much established under the Dangerous Lunatics Acts of the, the mid-1830s. This was done as a reaction to a murder in Dublin of a prominent bank manager who was murdered by somebody who was refused admission to the Richmond Asylum. So this legislation was passed within a context of a public outcry about it. There was a scandal associated with this murder. And this has led to an unfortunate legacy where there's a continued stigmatisation of mental illness in Ireland at the moment and a continued association with being dangerous. It is an extraordinary piece of legislation. It applied only to Ireland because Irish lunacy legislation differed from that uh, that applied to England and Scotland and Wales. Under the Act, any person could be accused of being a dangerous lunatic. Uh, evidence did not have to be provided. Evidence of insane behaviour didn't have to be corroborated. Justices of the peace could, at a family's um, suggestion, declare that an individual was dangerous owing to lunacy or possibly in some cases intellectual disability. And that person then had to be transported to the asylum by the police. And under this legislation, the asylum had to accept the person. So the dangerous lunacy procedure quickly became the admission pathway of choice for families who sought to have an individual committed to an asylum. It dispensed with the need to transport the patient and the asylum had to accept them. So th this system was open to abuse, this system was abused. It's very common in the case notes to see quite full accounts of uh, that the allegations that patients made that they have been committed because there's a dispute over land. So it is a terribly dangerous piece of legislation and one that really survives until the Mental Health Act of 1945. A typical case was that of James H. from Roscommon. His sister had him committed in 1893, but he was deemed sane and discharged. She, however, was determined to be rid of him and tried again. About a year later, he is once again committed under the Dangerous Lunatics Act and he's brought as was required under the Act, under armed constabulary escort to the asylum. And the constable who comes with him says to the physician that he knows the family and has known them for years, that the brother is a little bit odd, but he's not insane, and that his sister stabbed herself in the leg and claimed that the brother had done it in order to have him committed. But as the story unfolds, it emerges that the sister is engaged to be married, and the fiancé has said that he won't marry her until the brother is cleared off the farm. He wanted clear ownership of, of the farm um, by marriage through the sister. So she allegedly had her brother committed twice, uh, a false committal. But the brother contracted dysentery in the asylum about a fortnight after he entered and died. The asylum archives are full of records, uh, relatives inquiring about, horribly in some cases, inquiring about the state of health of individual patients and asking to be informed if they die. Uh, because they're going to trigger a, a dispute over succession. Dozens of case books full of these kinds of stories survive. But as the old institutions shut down, there's a danger this unique archive may be lost or damaged. Brian Donnelly from the National Archives is in a race against time to save these records, many of which have ended up stored in damp basements. Oh, yes. I was just wondering if we could track them through any of the bound records. Mm you know, is due to the fact that staff in these institutions took an interest in preserving them, that the material survived, the records of the mental hospitals and the records of the HSE in general, uh, they need statutory protection. They need to be protected by legislation. And at the moment, there is no statutory protection for these records. Yes, now it's that that I was looking for. Aside from land, the records and case books also contain many references to emigration, the other dominant factor affecting the nation's psyche. 
And the migration that we get in the 1840s and the 1850s is unprecedented in international migration. You're talking about in the region of 2 million people in the 1840s, 1850s and 1860s leaving the country. And that has psychological uh, implications as well in terms of dislocation and in terms of the people who are left behind. Among the saddest groups in the hospitals in Ireland were those labelled insane by the US immigration authorities and sent home again. Many ended up here in Our Ladies in Cork, having disembarked at Cove and found their way to the nearest asylum. There they languished, often for the rest of their lives. Emigrating families then began to take their own precautions. If a family were being processed at Ellis Island and one of the members uh, was clearly behaving peculiarly and was likely to become a burden on state resources, uh, the whole family were likely to be turned back. And I think it's for that reason that in those cases, which are not enormous, but they are certainly significant and steady year on year. Uh, the asylum is used and the Dangerous Lunatics Act is used as a means of, of uh, placing those people very swiftly into the asylum uh, while the family move on. That sense of abandonment was a common experience of asylum inmates down the centuries. It was keenly felt by Hannah Greeley in St. Lomans, Mullingar. Out of thousands of patients, only 10, on average, were discharged each month. The exodus was always equaled, if not exceeded, by the influx. Sometimes a crushed spirit breaks from mental agony and anguish when she understands at last that she is a captive in a free society. And there's one very difficult point when Hannah tells us that her mother informs Hannah that she has actually rented out Hannah's bedroom to two teachers, as it turns out. And at that moment, it feels as if Hannah has been completely abandoned by her family and hence by the whole of society outside because her family and her mother was the last link to the outside world. In sharp contrast to the continuing decline in the nation's population, the numbers in mental hospitals never stopped increasing. The Ballinasloe Asylum became such a fixture that it entered the language of the west of Ireland. The Irish expression, Cruach She Serhu, or it would drive you mad, means literally to drive you east. In other words, towards Ballin the Slow. Overcrowding within the institutions inevitably made life miserable for patients. Year after year, the Inspector of Lunacy reported that parts of some hospitals were in such poor condition they should be shut down. Then, as in more recent times, this made little impact. In terms of uh, contemporary resonance, what is striking is how the same kinds of concerns appear every year in the inspector's reports from the 1800s right up to the present day. In other words, the inspectors remain concerned about many of the same things that concerned them in the 1800s. And that's not to say there's been no progress whatsoever. Uh, many of the old institutions have been closed, some have been reinvented, uh, somehow, some of the institutions have been deinstitutionalized themselves somewhat, but there are some uh, facilities where the comments of the current inspector uh, seem, to, seem to harken back to the comments in the 1800s. And caught up with the thousands now behind the walls were all kinds of other groups who needed care but were not mentally ill. Some with intellectual disabilities remain within the system even today. The more curable cases were lodged higher up in the institution. But as one descended through the building, the cases tended to be more serious and less curable until finally one came to the basement where the worst of the cases were kept. They were a subterranean group who very often didn't see the light of day. The other big interesting group are the epileptics. Uh, who, again, are not suitable cases for treatment within the district asylum system because they are incurable, but they're also not mentally ill. But because there's a great deal of fear and stigma associated with epilepsy, uh, the Dangerous Lunatic Act once again comes into play and is used as a means of committing epileptics who should not be in the asylum system, but who are not discharged because they're not cured. For Hannah Greeley in St. Lomans, hope was fading. After some years, she was transferred to a more severe ward area, known by patients as Long Trench. But worse was to follow. 
No Hope Hold, the chief security ward, was directly beneath Long Trench. The female padded cells were there. The straitjacket was used in the hold, and sedatives and other special drugs. Strict security precautions and punishment were the order of the day. If you were in Long Trench, it was said, and you as much as raised your voice, you might be seized immediately by four or five nurses and rushed below to No Hope Hold. There you were tamed or shamed, to become dispirited and hopeless. Savers, eye tests are now half price for a limited time only. Ten years had passed for Hannah Greeley, locked away in St. Lomans, Mullingar. It was now that she faced her worst nightmare. She was moved to the punitive, high security area known to the patients as No Hope Hold. Her prospects of getting out had all but vanished. But the overall feeling is of the utter desolation and the sort of despair of never getting out and the repeated attempts to try and get out, including two attempts physically to escape. And subsequent to both of those attempts, she's punished by the institution. She also describes her attempts to take her own life, which is another form of escape, and again, which bring on punishment by the institution. During the five years I spent in the hold, I often prayed for a firing squad. Something quick and clean, anyway. I was allowed out of bed, but only just, to the toilet and to the weekly bath. I was kept under constant supervision. I was now considered unpredictable and a danger to smug officialdom. A year after I went there, I saw my face in a night nurse's mirror. There were no mirrors in the hold. How strange my face was. So different. My eyes were sorrowful with dark irises, and I used to have gay, laughing eyes. Part of the power and control that they had was the way in which they could interpret and label all forms of behaviour. So, for instance, Hannah's attempts to escape, which are perfectly normal, it's a perfectly normal, very reasonable response to incarceration, the attempt to escape is what we would all try and do, but her attempts to escape are interpreted as symptomatic of her instability. So it creates this kind of uh, vicious circle whereby the power to name and label the behaviour is held by certain inst individuals and institutions and that and every form of behaviour is used to vindicate and justify the label in the first place. Across the centuries, there were roughly equal numbers of men and women in the asylums, but what is striking is that the vast majority of them were single. This, of course, mirrored the society outside, where the changed marriage patterns resulting from the famine had, by the mid-20th century, caused Ireland to have the lowest marriage rate in the world. Up until the 1960s, almost three out of every four men below the age of 45 were unmarried. For women below 45, two out of every three remained single. And in a society which frowns so severely on sex outside marriage, the stresses for many were stark. There was such a range of calibrated institutions dotted throughout the landscape to deal with every eventuality, um, to ensure the survival of a particular economic form of, of, of survival, the, the family farm. And those that were surplus to requirement, these institutions served in a very calibrated, in a relatively sophisticated way, to manage all of those surplus members, the unmarried mother, the unwanted child, the unwanted relative that may be hanging on the land, the uh, unmarried uncle sitting around the place. There was an institution for everybody that was not economically productive on the family farm. The idea, again, of Ireland as the maternal isle, uh, as a caring isle, as full of communities that were deeply committed to the family, that were deeply committed to the welfare of each other. The way to perpetuate that myth is to hide and incarcerate any individuals who are seen to challenge it. 
As the numbers in the hospitals shot up, so too did the various treatments performed on the 20,000 or so patients in the system. From the 1930s onwards, Ireland was at the cutting edge of techniques such as lobotomy, electric shock treatment and insulin coma therapy. These treatments enable psychiatry to emerge as a more clearly defined speciality, allowing psychiatrists to integrate themselves more firmly into mainstream medicine. But many of the procedures were experimental, even dangerous, none more so than the use of various substances to bring on convulsions. They induced the convulsion by giving uh, chemicals like metrazole, which was, there are some patients, at least some years ago, I remember talking to them in St. Eta's, I remember that with utter terror, because you'd slowly wait for the convulsion to start happening. And it will emerge that you get a lot of kind of compound, um, compound fractures in the spine, kind of dislocations of the jaw and arms. It's, it's very violent, very dramatic kind of therapy. Internationally, at least, the reports are physicians don't like it. It's too dramatic. It's too, you know, people turn blue. And you have kind of scenes of, you know, uh, doctors chasing patients down the corridor with syringes. Then ultimately, there was um, electricity was used to produce seizures, uh, which was uh, electroconvulsive therapy. Now, at the time when these, see, these, this treatment was introduced, these seizures were what's called unmodified. In other words, the individual did not have a general anaesthetic and they actually experienced a full seizure. Uh, today, on the very rare occasions when electroconvulsive therapy is used, the person has a general anaesthetic and the physical manifestations of any seizure um, are, are minimal and they're carried out in hospital environments with anaesthetists. Hannah Greeley both witnessed and experienced some of these brand new treatments in St. Lomans during the 1940s. She reported that her own sessions of electric shock treatment knocked her out cold, but otherwise had little effect. During the trial period of ECT, three patients were done each night, Sundays accepted. The patients were half dragged, half propelled, one by one, to the ECT inside. They kicked and screamed without exception, and one patient lay on the floor and was dragged in. Some sense of the routine nature of ECT in the 1940s and 50s comes from a discussion among retired psychiatric nurses recorded 20 years ago in St Mary's Psychiatric Hospital, Castle Bar. Most of them got ECT, mm. straight. They got ECT straight until they didn't know their name, which is usually eight or nine in a row, or maybe Sunday mm. in escape, that was the only day. And when they didn't know their name, they were left in that state of confusion for a week, maybe. And after two weeks in the war 16, they considered them fit for moaning, which was the parent. One of the effects of the introduction of these um, kind of therapies is, is a noticeable change in the case books in terms of the representation of the person. Instead of saying this person was despondent today or dirty or tidy or quiet and nice or whatever, it is simply a, a record that they had ECT today, ECT today, ECT today. While ECT remains in use, though now with full anaesthetic and muscle relaxant, many of the other techniques of the time were eventually abandoned. One of the most popular during the mid-decades of the 20th century was insulin coma therapy. The, the treatment consisted of giving a large dose of insulin which put the person into a hypoglycemic coma, which of course is very dangerous, and you had to get after they left them for 20 minutes, half an hour, and then you had to get, introduce glucose into the stomach through a stomach tube because they were in deep coma. And if you didn't get that tube in, I used to be absolutely terrified because if it went into the lungs, of course, you'd kill them. And uh, if you didn't get it in in time, and in, when I was in John of God, one, he was actually a priest, uh, it wasn't, thank God it wasn't myself, it was the doctor working with me, didn't manage to get the tube down in time. And uh, that priest was irreparably brain damaged. And I remember spending, watching him the next four months like an animal crawling around a pen until he died. This is of some idea of the, the potential horror of this treatment. I was injected with insulin early in the morning. I came round from my unconscious state. I felt dizzy, 
I would become conscious then of a huge mug of shiny white liquid stickiness pressed to my lips. I would gulp it down until the reaction. Good. And then I would retch violently. I felt exhausted, weak, ill, and I was disgusted with such sickening treatment. It continued for the next week. The psychiatrist was not easily discouraged from his experiments, and he explained to me tersely that naturally it was revolting to me, but that I should persevere. Certainly as time went on, it became apparent insulin coma therapy simply did not work. It carried risks that were far outweighed any possible benefits and the treatment was then abandoned. Perhaps the most damaging of all procedures developed at the time was lobotomy, where parts of the brain were surgically severed. It was widely performed in Ireland. One of its pioneers was American psychiatrist Walter Freeman, who made this film of himself performing his transorbital lobotomy in the 1950s. And at a depth of five centimetres, swings the handle far laterally. This was a highly controversial procedure, and a number of Freeman's patients died as a result of it. Others, including Rosemary Kennedy, sister of American President John F. Kennedy, were permanently brain damaged. She was only 23 when she had her operation. Walter Freeman personally lobotomized over 3,000 people, including a number of children. When I first qualified, that was in 1955 I started, I was working in the brain unit in the, in the old Richmond. And that was really my first exposure to lobotomy. Now, I didn't know anything about it at the time, but every Saturday morning, patients were arriving down from Grange Gorman and that was the major operation done at that time where you drilled a burr hole in each side here and put a knife in and completely severed the frontal lobes from the rest of the brain. And it was supposed to be the miracle treatment for quietening difficult patients. And it certainly did quieten major parts of Grange Gorman. The actual result, of course, was these patients were often then discharged quiet and were behaving like... Uh, untrained animals defecating on the floor at home and literally turned into vegetables. That was the horror of lobotomy. And that was being practiced on thousands and thousands of patients across the Western world. While the treatments might have been changing, living conditions in the hospitals remained grim. St. Luke's and Clonmel was singled out for a damning report in 1958. That same year saw a record number of over 21,000 patients in psychiatric hospitals. It's startling to compare this with the numbers in prisons at the time, less than 500 for each year up to the 1960s. The report on conditions in Clonmel is to be found in the National Archives. It had been submitted to the Department of Health by the Assistant Inspector of Mental Hospitals. Veteran mental health campaigner Annie Ryan unearthed it during the research for her book on the history of mental health care in Ireland. I started my research by digging into all the Inspector of Mental Hospitals reports. And they're very interesting, but there's a lot unsaid. And so I said, I must get these. So that's when I found Clonmel. And I found my worst fears, really. Uh, it was like uh, if you take each w section, uh, what it felt like to be in a ward which was a stench of urine in it, the, the lack of, of light, the coldness in the winter. It was sheer and absolute cruelty. Certainly this has to be one of the most appalling accounts of life uh, in an institution with 900 people. When you read through the report, the descriptions of the, the, the kitchens, the type of food that was being served to the residents there, the use of agricultural implements to cut up the food, 
the description of the mouldy black potatoes, cold potatoes being handed over to the patients, the general sense of squalor, the description of the dormitories with faeces on the floor, patients being stripped at six o'clock in the evening so that they were brought to bed at half six in that evening, being moved from a downstairs room upstairs all naked, women without sanitary towels, it really is one of the most extraordinary accounts of life in an institution in the 20th century. The response of the Department of Health to this devastating report was to convene a big meeting of senior officials. There were various proposals to improve matters, but very little happened. One clear decision which did emerge, though, was to keep the report secret. It was even withheld from the board of the hospital itself to minimise the risk of it leaking out publicly. In this case, both the local authorities and the central government department, the Department of Health, were fully aware of what was happening. They made a decision to suppress it, to conceal it, to uh, sanitise what was happening. But undoubtedly, they, they knew. And what makes it worse is the account, both from the Dr Ramsey and from the Department of Health, that this is not unique. We have the detailed report in Clamel, we don't have reports on the other institutions, but it is very clear from the official view on this that Clonmel was not unusual. Uh, given that there were in excess of 20 such institutions throughout the country at that time, holding nearly 21,000 uh, patients, this is clearly replicated across the country. Um, it's certainly one of the most damning documents um, ever, I think, on an institution in our society. The Department of Health did write to all of the psychiatrists in charge of the mental hospitals at the time, asking them what improvements they needed made. It was reported that six never bothered to reply, and most of the others were defensive, denying there was anything wrong with their facilities. St. Brendan's Grange Gorman in the 1950s and 60s would have been typical of the many vast and overcrowded institutions throughout the country. I started in St. Brendan's, uh, Grange Gorman as it was called then, in, in um, late 1956. At that time there were 2,000 patients in Grange Gorman and individual wards could accommodate as much as 120 patients. I remember going down into the, what they call the lower house, that was the main female section, and being in one of these wards, uh, we went through a number of them, but it was just an extraordinary scene, just extraordinary congestion and uh, the only way they could contain some of the disturbance, and it was often worst in the women's wards, was to seat them backwards into a big form, a big, like a, like a school bench, and just hold them there indefinitely. But people were jumping and throwing, putting dresses over their heads, and it was just a, a picture of, of utter chaos. There was a big dining hall there, and... Again, it was like heydays where people flinging plates. And so it was that impression of utter chaos, of, of everything moving and extraordinary overcrowding. The hubbub, the noise, the um, chaos of these large wards, I think had to be experienced firsthand to realise what it was like. There was this sort of escalation of discomfort, escalation of noise of tumult, um, which was obviously anti-therapeutic. It illustrated this thing, of course, that a mental hospital is not about a place of treatment for the so-called mentally ill. It was a, it's a housing warehouse, so every kind of person who wasn't wanted in society was dumped in there. Thousands died within the institutions, often buried unnamed in mass graves like this one in Glasnevin Cemetery, for the inmates of St. Brendan's Grange Gorman. Their unclaimed belongings ended up stored in the attics of the hospital from where they were recently rescued by a dedicated group of former staff members under the guidance of the National Archives. Some of the material goes back perhaps 100 or 110 years. The bulk of it probably dates uh, from the 30s, 40s and 50s. Property of patients, many of whom must have died here, you know, in, in the hospital. But, uh, you know, it's really of great interest and, and uh, it's a, a very poignant reminder of uh, some of the people who passed through the hospital over the years. You have an, you know, a deep memory of the vacant stare, both men and women sitting by the wall, 
not communicating with each other, with perhaps an outburst of disturbance. But as I say, the, the apathy is the thing that I, would abide with me mainly. You really saw a parade of patients, and all you could do was look at the medical charts to see what sort of medication they were on. But you wouldn't see the same patient again unless you were very lucky. So there was no possibility of actually helping another human being. I considered then and always that my long detention in the big house was unjust and unnecessary, no matter who or what was responsible. I thought of people in prison. They at least knew their sentences. I had gone into hospital for a rest, and look at the rest. Fourteen years gone already, and very little rest at that. Unlike so many others, Hannah Greeley was eventually released. It was the 1960s, and attitudes were beginning to change. But it was to be many decades before the power of the huge institutions was broken. And I sometimes think if we imagine, you know, the physicality of these institutions standing very grey, very austere, very dreary outside of the towns, with very high walls around them, very little movement. Once people went inside, they didn't move out again. So there was a sense that people were locked away forever, and they were indeed many locked away forever. But I sometimes think about these institutions as also existing kind of at the edges of people's imagination. The power of those institutions was constantly there. The kind of threat implicit in somebody being in Mullingar or somebody being in Balnasloe. The years there seemed like an eternity to me. And yet when I left, they dropped from me like an old garment that I expect never to see again. I went in an impulsive, uninhibited girl, and I left a cautious, subdued, almost servile woman. I am now a sadder, but a wiser woman, and one who can say with certainty that knowledge and freedom are happiness. If you have been affected by issues raised in this programme, please turn to RT Erta, page 700, and you can see the second part of this programme at the same time of 25 to 10 next Monday night. Up next, 9-11, the day the world changed.